There was a lot of mission creep actually. I started studying philosophy mainly for a lack of interest in other subjects, but then I always had an interest in economics and politics, of the ways in which sort of social science interacts with the policy making process. And I ended up learning that you could actually study that under the guise of philosophy. So I started doing philosophy of economics and political theory and so on. And one thing led to another, and then I find myself with two degrees, one in economics and one in philosophy of science. In a way, I think of myself as doing economics at the same time as I do philosophy. I'm a professor of practical philosophy, but much of my work falls in the intersection of the two disciplines, which means that I'm as much an economist as I am a, a philosopher these days. There are philosophers who think of themselves as a sort of science police, as their job as sort of intervening in scientific processes and figure out who does it right and who does it wrong. I think of my work as slightly different from that. I'm interested mainly in exploring the nature of various scientific tools and theories, what they are about, and also explore their advantages and disadvantages. One of the things that I'm interested in is figuring out how you can legitimately use one of these tools and theories, for example, in the policymaking process. So a nudge is an effort to change people's behavior for some purpose that involves like increasing the person's well-being or health or happiness or some such. It's supposed to be a softer intervention than the traditional tools of like incentives and bans and mandates and so on. But it's supposed to nonetheless be fairly effective in shifting people's behavior for good. I think there are reasons when a nudge is called for. I think there are lots of opportunities to improve the world in which we live, to make it more conducive to human health and, and happiness. There are also some dangers. One is that of inefficacy. It's unclear if nudges is going to help us solve all of the problems we're facing, but they can certainly help on the margin in certain contexts. That's a great question, but I think the ob most obvious reason is the fact that when people talk about nudging, even in traditional economic contexts, they phrase it in terms of traditional philosophical terms. So the goal is to enhance a person's well-being without interfering with their autonomy or, the, or their freedom. And words like well-being and autonomy and freedom and liberty are obviously terms that philosophers have struggled with for literally 2,500 years in the Western tradition alone. So philosophers have maybe not like settled on the correct answer to what these things are, but we certainly have some things to contribute to the debate, if only because we can help economists avoid having to reinvent the wheel. Now, I'm under no illusions that I'm going to fix the world, and economics is particularly insular by comparison to other disciplines. But there's a community of scholars in philosophy of economics who operate, in methodology of economics, history of economics, who operate in the intersection between the two disciplines. So that means that the borders are permeable. At least some of the things we talk about and some of the ideas we come up with and some of the solutions we propose filter into the consciousness of the average economist. But then it's important to note also that the kind of work that we do, exploring the promises and pitfalls of economics aim at an audience outside of economics proper. So we're interested in talking to people who are not economists, but who care about the way in which economics is used in the policy process, for example. I think this area is going to be huge. As it turns out, many of the problems that economists are concerned about, including questions about inequality and poverty and uh, welfare promotion, are things that we are concerned with in the intersection of these disciplines. So when it comes to inequality, for example, this is something that philosophers and political theorists have talked about for ages. And so now that economists have a, a newfound interest in these things, it's perfectly obvious that there are insights that they can benefit from. And I think the general trend is toward more interaction, more collaborative work, and more interact, more interdisciplinary publications involving teams of both philosophers and economists exploring ideas of common interests. Oh, happiness is super fascinating, in part because there are few people who don't care about happiness in their own lives, but it matters also because economists are interested not just in describing the world, but in making it a better place, and that's often understood in terms of enhancing their well-being. Now, what is well-being? 
You could disagree about that, but for many people, well-being involves essentially some consideration of happiness. And then we have the choice, how are we going to promote happiness? Are we going to do it based on like, common sense notions, things that we've been telling each other for generations? Or are we going to do it in a way that's informed by the best available social science? And to me, the answer is obvious. To the extent that there is scientific evidence to depend on, we should at least, to some extent, take it into account in thinking about how to build a society that's most conducive to happiness and whatever other values values we wish to promote. Philosophers have access to enormous numbers of, of theories and concepts and so on that are immediately useful to the practicing economist. But then philosophers also are in the habit of like, looking at large bodies of text and teasing out the important assumptions and exposing them to, to sunlight, as it were. And maybe the world would not be a better place if everybody were a philosopher, but the world is definitely a better place if there are some philosophers who are part of the conversation.